most of the time we have an objective. Uh, sometimes we do what's called the fog of war, where I'm the only one on the battlefield that knows what's going on. So, you know, I'm trying to maneuver the forces either for the good or for the bad, because they're either going to win or lose, but I'm the only one that knows. And sometimes it's just, I have to get run those things through my head constantly to know where to put them so that they get overrun or where to put them so that they can charge at the right time, things like that. I have to be in command. My name is Brenton Charles Kemmer. I'm a major in the 3rd Massachusetts Regiment of the Massachusetts Provincial Battalion. If you want to go way back, my, my parents, whenever we went on family vacations, my dad made a point if we were by a historic site, we'd stop. Um, I just got some pictures from them the other day that I had taken back in the 60s, like 1960, 61, with an old camera that I had when I was a kid, and it had old Fort Niagara on there, where I go every year now. So that, that kind of thing kind of gave us an interest in, in history. How, how exactly was it that you first got interested in it or find yourself doing this? Well, I'd have to blame that on my wife. Um, I had always wanted a, a musket or a rifle to hang above a fireplace. thought that would be quite neat looking. And she bought me a kit for Christmas one year. And a friend of mine, his wife, did the same thing. We spent the winter putting them together. And naturally in the spring we had to see how they would shoot. So we went to a couple of muzzleloading shoots. And it kind of snowballed. We did the shooting. There were a few guys that were dressed in period clothing, and we thought that would be a nice idea, too. It was about the same time I was going for my teaching degree. I wanted to do something that would have been more apropos for what I would be educating kids in. I wanted to do something more appropriate for Michigan's history, so I chose the French and Indian War time period. It's one of the wars uh, in our history with here in the United States that really isn't taught as extensively as it should be. If it wasn't for the French Indian War, there would never have been a Revolutionary War. Some of the mindset was, was started back 20 years earlier. So that's one of the major reasons I chose it. We have our original Colonel Bagley's, our guys that are dressed in their blue red face uniforms. Then we have Partridge's Light Infantry, a group of guys that were doing lights in the 42nd, who now also come with us and do this. And we have our t attached artillery. We've got three three pounders in the unit, a couple of swivel guns in the unit. We've got a guy that's got a uh, large whale boat, so we have attached naval force. A couple guys doing Native American, so we've combined into a battalion now. We may be starting a new company to go with it in the battalion of Grenadiers also. And that would give us pretty much all the different uh, units that would have been within a, a whole battalion of men from the colony, the Bay Colony at that time. It'll make us whole that way. Owens, you're going to make room for bags. We're coming through. You ready, Bagley's? Tools are down. You ready? Let's okay. go. I go in down. Our tacticals or battles are choreographed ahead of time. Sometimes we gleam from an actual original battle, and in the choreography, we know where to move the troops safely, how to keep guys out of the range of, for instance, enemy cannon that's pointed at them uh, so you don't get blown over backwards or powder burns things. If we want a certain number of casualties, the officers, just like in real army, we give the orders to the NCOs and the NCOs make sure that it happens. And there's times where we'll say, well, okay, I need 25% of the men to take a casualty. And the NCOs go down the line and they're telling them, prepping them, the next volley I want, you know, one out of every four men I want you to go down. French regular, French regular. Any alive? We have one alive here, does not speak English. Is he alive or dead? 
He doesn't know. The Grand Encampment was a group of uh, individuals in the French Indian War community that wanted to attempt to do an extra special event and a very, very large event in North America. And we had uh, 1,300 reenactors at that one, one of the largest in the United States that we've ever had. Since you are the major, you, you're basically in command of the British forces. Well, I was in command of, of Grand Encampment 1 and Grand Encampment 2. Uh, we'll probably have someone different for the next Grand Encampment. So that had to feel Oh, it, it, it felt very exhilarating. Escort him now. Captain. Uh, you stay there. Captain. What would you say are some of like the more common misconceptions for uh, reenactors and so forth, and perhaps the French and Indian War reenactors? The blatant things that come to mind, we were cooking over the fire, my wife and a couple of the other ladies, and we're sitting there also, and this uh, one guy comes by with his little kid, probably about four years old, something like that, five years old, and he's talking to him about the fire and what they're doing and stuff, and and he says, you know, that's not a real fire. And he reached down and picked up one of the red hot coals out of there to show his son. <laughs> Burned his fingers pretty good. <laughs> but, you know, he tried to tell him, yes, it is. And he didn't want to listen. Well, that was the thing. That was my argument again. This was too. pretty much a conscious effort. Now, we got into the reenacting end of it. And went when I went to school studying history, I have a master's in history, and it kind of snowballed into that. That's what I fell in love with. And uh, Decided that the house would look like it. Made the fort a uh, British outpost. Uh, we have a, a garrison building that bunks 23 men, uh, enclosed in a stockade. We'd like to change that stockade over to some earthworks to make it more substantial and something we don't have to prepare so often. Uh, the the French have been given not given some property, but their use of property and their building a stockade and plan on putting a. a garrison building for themselves too over there so we can have the reenactments back and forth as well I have a couple of cannons wrote several books on history so it's it's years of research on my part uh, obviously because I portray my my reenacting the Massachusetts era I did that also with the novels it just all kind of works together Major. okay the front's empty double quick move 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 Come on, move it. And it's not just a, a fake thing. If you're going to be the commander, even if you're going to be an NCO, you are in command. And you have to be when, you, when it's time and you're on. Go. It's not a fake thing. It's, it's got to be Go. a real thing to work. Go. Get it. Run. Straight up in the air. Straight up in the air. Up the air. Up the air. Up the air. My biggest kick out of is actually being right on that tactical field with all the smoke and all the booming going on and the screaming and hollering. That's I really enjoy that and I really enjoy just being around the campfire after everything's done too. Being with all the guys and their families. Mm -hmm. It's a big extended family. <laughs>